Hello there, this is Chu Socrates. Welcome to today's video where we will be talking about recursive sequences and the monotone conversions uh, theorem. So in our last uh, video, we were talking about infinite sequences. So a sequence is basically just a list of numbers and we often give a formula for the terms of a sequence as a function. So a sub n is a function of n. And usually this allows us to find any term of the sequence that we want right away. We can find a1, a2, a100, a1 million just by plugging in a hundred or a million into the formula for a sub n. But today we're going to look at sequences where it's not so easy to find any term of the sequence that you want. You kind of have to start at the beginning and work your way up. So in this video, we are basically going to cover sections 1c and 1d from our textbook. And if you're not one of my students, you can go to the description of the video where there will be a link to Dropbox and you can download my textbook. So first things first, let us define what is a recursive sequence. So here's the definition, which appears in section 1c, page 26 of our textbook. What is a recursive sequence? A sequence a sub n and from zero to infinity is said to be rec defined recursively if we specify the values of a sub zero through a sub k for some natural number k and a formula for defining the next term a n plus one in terms of a zero through a n for every natural number the specified terms a sub 0 through a sub k that we mentioned in the first sentence are called the seeds of our recursive sequence. In its simplest form, we specify a sub 0 as the only seed and a formula for defining a n plus 1 in terms of a sub n for every natural number n. And the result is called a recursive sequence. So we saw in the last video that we don't have to start our sequence at a0 uh, or even a1. Uh, we can start it anywhere that we want as long as there is a way by which we can uh, define all the terms of our sequence. So let's go to our workroom and we will see an example of a recursive sequence. All right, so here is uh, our example. Suppose that a sub 1 our seed is 8, and a sub n plus 1 is defined to be 7 minus 4 over 3 a sub n, where in this formula, n goes from 1, 2, 3, to positive infinity, as integers, of course. So this formula says, if you want a 2, to get 2 as a subscript, n has to be 1, which makes sense. It's the starting subscript. So n is 1, so that means a sub 1, which means that a 2 is 7 minus 4 over 3 a sub 1. All right, so we can change that to simply a sub 1, which means that we replace a sub 1 with 8 because that is our seed. So we get 7 minus 4 over 3 times 8. So yeah, that is 7 minus 1 over 6, I guess, but uh, maple, you get, yes, 7 minus 1, 6, or 6.833333. All right, so uh, we're going to compute more terms, um, but we're going to, un unlike most of the time when we want exact answers, we're going to just get decimal approximations. Okay, so next we want a sub 3. So if you want the subscript to be 3, then this time n has to be 2, which means we want 7 minus 4 over 3 times a2, but we computed a2 in the last step. Okay, so this is why finding the terms of a recursive sequence is not quite as easy as we saw in the last video, because you literally have to work your way upwards. If you want a3, you got to have a2. All right, so change that to a three, and this now becomes four, uh, sorry, three times a sub two. Okay, 
So we're going to replace the 8 there with this, 6.83333. So we're going to copy that here. And then we are going to compute this quantity, right? So maple, how much do we have now? 6.804. Hmm. All right. So our terms were, the first term was 8. Now we have 6.83. Now we have 6.804. Uh, one more. So I hope you see the pattern. We basically have the same skeleton, same structure, and I will copy our previous computation, but we will change this to A4. If I want A4, we want 7 minus 4 over 3A sub 3, which means that we replace 6.8 blah 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 with 6.8048 blah blah blah. All right, so we replace it with that. And then we get our decimal approximation. How much are you? 6.80406. Hmm. So I hope you're seeing what I'm seeing. Uh, in the first section, we talked about the limit of a sequence, right? Is there a number that the terms of the sequence are approaching? In other words, if you graph the sequence, uh, will you see a horizontal asymptote that the terms of the sequence, the graph, uh, is approaching? Okay, so uh, it looks like um, the numbers are kind of slowing down. Uh, so maybe, maybe there is a limit to the sequence. Let's go through it one more time. So we want now a sub 5, 7 minus 4 over 3 times a sub 4 which means that we replace this number by a sub 4 and we compute the number. We get 6.804038. So that didn't change very much. Okay, it's kind of slowing down, don't you think? Okay, so by the end of the video, we will see that the sequence really does converge. And uh, guess what? In our title, we talked about recursive sequences and the monotone convergence sequence. So it's the monotone convergence sequence, uh, I'm sorry, monotone convergence theorem that's going to tell us that our sequence, sequence converges. So before we do that though, um, I want to show you in GeoGebra how we can, com can compute the terms of the, the sequence in a more, uh, well, it's in a, in an easier way using a spreadsheet. All right, off to GeoGebra. All right, so here's the welcoming screen of GeoGebra. And I wanted to show it to you because uh, here we see the spreadsheet command. So just click on that and we get a spreadsheet over here. In a minute, I'm going to scoot over there. Uh, but before we do that, let me go to settings, which is in this waffle over here. Let's change settings so that we get uh, more decimal places. 10 decimal places is usually enough. And let's increase the font size so we can, the better to see it. All right. So let me pause this. All right. So here is our spreadsheet. Uh, first thing we're going to do is we're going to create just the, the list of natural numbers here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So we will type number one uh, for A and see how, how much bigger it is. And then we will make GeoGebra generate the other numbers for us easily. So this is cell A1, right? So in A2, I will say I want one plus A sub one. All right, so that will of course give us two. Of course, we know how to count. Now that we have that though, notice how when I move the cursor to the right, uh, lower right corner here, uh, it might not show up because of screencast o -matic, but you should see a plus sign when you move your cursor to the lower right corner. Click on that and hold it, and then you're going to drag it down like this. Ta-da! So now we see the numbers one, through 10. 
Okay, so we said um, that our formula for the sequence is, well, that's the seed. The first term is 8, so we're going to type in the number 8 over there. So 8 is now in B1, and we want the next term. So it says in our recipe, the next term is 7 minus 4 over 3 times the previous term. All right, so we will type in 7 minus 4 divided by 3 times. I'm going to put parenthesis because otherwise it will move B1 into the numerator. So 3 times B1. Okay, so I am explicitly putting the times um, operator there. Boom. Sometimes Judge Hepa gets confused. So there we go. That was the second term that we got in our uh, workroom. So, same thing. We will take this corner and we're going to drag it down. Ooh, okay. So those numbers should look familiar. If you don't believe me, backtrack. Okay, so next, um, we want to graph the sequence. So we're going to do that in column C, where we will graph the points. So remember, to graph a point in GeoGebra, you just want the x and the y coordinates. So in this case, we have parentheses for the points a1 comma b1. So the x coordinate will be a1, the y coordinate will be b1. Boom, there it is. There is our uh, first term for the sequence. And yeah, I decided to start with a1 instead of a0, uh, just because um, it's a little bit more natural that you see, okay, that's row one, that's one, that's uh, a sub one. Okay. So Neo, uh, I don't need all of this room. We can shift this to the left and we can see more of our terms over here and maybe zoom in just a little bit. Okay, I think that's good. So we're going to take this cell. So it's being highlighted right now. I'm going to take the lower right corner and drag me down, right? So, ooh, okay, so there we go. Those are the other terms of our sequence. So again, if you change the dot there, okay. So yeah, it does look that there should be a horizontal asymptote going on there. And uh, yeah, if you want to change the appearance of the dots, you can do that again in the second, in the settings. So let's see if it'll do it for me. Yeah, so if you, uh, there, okay, that's redefined. But yeah, you can, uh, highlight one of them. Let me go to the uh, waffle and let me see. Nah, nah, never mind. Okay, so let's go uh, back to our PDF and we're going to talk about the monotone convergence theorem uh, where we will see a way by which we can show that the sequence actually does converge. All right, so, so in order for us to make sense of the monotone convergence theorem, uh, we need to know a couple of terms. So here are some definitions uh, for words that will be appearing in that theorem. So these definitions talk about monotonic and bounded sequences. A sequence A sub n is increasing if A0 is less than or equal to A1, which is less than or equal to A2, and so on. So in other words, the terms are getting bigger. Similarly, a sequence is decreasing if the terms are getting smaller. A0 is bigger than A1, A1 is bigger than A2, and so on. So uh, we can lump these two kinds of sequences together and call them monotonic sequences. So a sequence is monotonic if it is either increasing or decreasing. Um, and for emphasis, we can say that our sequ sequence is monotonic increasing or monotonic decreasing. Part two. A sequence is bounded below by a number lowercase m if m, lowercase m, is less than or equal to a sub n for all natural numbers n. In other words, all the terms are greater than or equal to this uh, lower bound. Okay, 
So M is called a lower bound for the sequence. Similarly, a sequence is bounded above by a number capital M if all the terms A sub N are less than or equal to capital M. A sub N is less than or equal to capital M for all natural numbers N. So this time, capital M is called an upper bound. We will put these two terms together now into the single word bounded. A sequence is bounded if we can find two numbers, our lower bound M and our upper bound capital M, so that all the terms A sub N are between lowercase m and capital M. And as before, uh, we call these two numbers bounds for the sequence. So even though little m is a lower bound and big M is an upper bound. A sequence is unbounded if it does not, if it does not have an upper bound or it does not have a lower bound. All right, so let's try to understand these, what, four uh, terms uh, using the geometric sequences that we saw in our first video. So I'm going over the examples that we, uh, we can see in sections 1a and 1b. And the first example there of a geometric sequence is 2 thirds to the power n. Okay, so 2 thirds is between 0 and 1. We know that if you graph 2 thirds to the x, it will be a decreasing function. And of course, we have a horizontal asymptote y equals 0. So this is a decreasing sequence if we now just look at 2 thirds to the n. And it is bounded above by a1, or if you like, a0. So the biggest value is 1 and all terms are below 1. Now, uh, all the terms are positive. So all the terms are bounded below by the number 0. All right, so this sequence is decreasing, monotonic decreasing, and bounded, bounded above by 1 and bounded below by 0. All right, so next, if we had negative 2 thirds to the power n, so we saw um, something similar to this. I believe we did negative 3 fifths to the n. Sometimes the terms are positive. Sometimes the terms are negative. That's because of the minus sign there, of course. If we take an even power, we will get a positive number. If we take an odd power, we will get a negative number. So we go from 1 to minus 2 thirds to plus 4 over 9 to minus this, plus this, blah, blah, blah. So it looks like the sequence does converge. We know that because this base is between negative one and positive one. But this time it's no longer monotonic decreasing or monotonic increasing. You might be fooled into believing, oh, but it's going down, but no, no, no. From here, you go down to here, and then you go up here. So you're zigzagging. It's neither monotonic increasing nor monotonic decreasing. However, is it still bounded? Okay, well, all the terms are below 1, just like before, or equal to 1. And uh, this time you have negative terms, but all of the negative numbers are greater than, let's say, negative 0.8. Okay, so our sequence is, our geometric, this geometric sequence is still bounded both above and below. All right, so now let's flip it. Instead of two thirds, let's look at three halves. Three halves is now bigger than one. So when you have an exponential function where the base is bigger than one, it's now an increasing function. And of course, the terms of our sequence also form an increasing sequence. Let's talk about bounds. Uh, everything is positive, so zero is again a lower bound, no problem. But we know that a to the x goes to infinity as x goes to positive infinity if the base a is bigger than 1. So therefore, this sequence is not bounded above. Consequently, it is not bounded. All right, so finally, let's see what happens if it's alternating. Negative 3 halves to the power n. 
So um, just like negative two thirds to the n, sometimes the terms are positive, sometimes the terms are negative. So uh, is it increasing or decreasing? Well, uh, so we go from here to here to here to here to here. So again, we're zigzagging up, down, up, down. So it's neither increasing nor decreasing. Uh, is there a lower bound? I don't think so. You can keep going down here and you can also keep going up here. So there is no upper bound there. So this is the worst kind of geometric sequence. It is neither monotonic, increasing, nor monotonic, decreasing, nor bounded below, nor bounded above. So yeah, nothing works. All right, so uh, it is worthwhile to uh, assemble, summarize our observations and generalize them, of course, to uh, any common ratio for our geometric sequence. If the common ratio is between 0 and 1, our first example, the sequence is both monotonic, decreasing, and bounded, both above and below. But if r is bigger than 1, the sequence is still monotonic, increasing, and is bounded below by 0, but it's not bounded above. It can keep going up to infinity because r is bigger than 1. If the r is between negative 1 and 0, so like negative 2 thirds to the n, the sequence is bounded. You know, it's still trapped between those two functions, but it's not monotonic. It goes down, up, down, up, down, up. If r is less than negative 1, the worst kind, the sequence is neither monotonic nor bounded. So uh, let's isolate the words bounded and monotonic into these observations. When is the sequence bounded? It's bounded in the first kind and in the third kind. So if the absolute value of r, our common ratio is smaller than 1, the sequence is bounded. Um, in, in all honesty, you can also include the number 1, although it makes for um, a boring sequence if r is exactly 1, it's constant. If r is negative 1, though, then you have an interesting alternating series uh, sequence, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, bounded but not monotonic. If your common ratio is bigger than 1, therefore the sequence is not going to be bounded. So now, what about monotonicity? Uh, if r is positive, uh, then the terms are always positive and the sequence is either monotonic decreasing or monotonic increasing. So either way, the sequence is monotonic. But if r is negative, we saw the one where we go down, up, down, up, down, up, like a zipper, uh, then the sequence is not going to be monotonic. All right, so here is the monotone convergence theorem, which is the title, part of the title of our video and the title of this section. Suppose that a sub n, n from zero to infinity, it's a monotonic sequence. It is either increasing or decreasing. Then, if the sequence is also bounded, then the sequence converges. However, if the sequence is unbounded, then the sequence diverges to infinity or diverges to negative infinity. So we saw in our last video what it means for a sequence to converge to a number, uh, but it can also diverge to plus infinity, diverge to minus infinity, or simply diverge. So in this case, we will not get the simply diverge uh, option because our sequence is either increasing or decreasing. So if it's unbounded, it will either diverge to plus infinity or diverge to minus infinity. Another way of stating the monotone convergence theorem is that a monotonic sequence converges if and only if it is bounded. Okay, so for the sake of completion, because this is such a, an important theorem, it will be needed to prove three of the seven uh, theorems that we will see regarding infinite series coming very, very soon. And so uh, I took the time to write a proof of the monotone convergence theorem in the next section, 1e, 
uh, which makes use of a very important property of the set of real numbers called the completeness axiom. Uh, the word axiom says we're going to believe that this statement is true and we will use it to prove that the MCT is true. Okay, what's important for our video today is to show how to apply the monotone convergence theorem to our example. So we're going to see that to do that, we will need the principle of mathematical induction. This is something that you saw in pre-calculus, or at least you should have seen it. And if you haven't, well, it's your lucky day. We are going to review how it works. All right, um, so to break it down, uh, Induction works in three steps, although in some more advanced books, uh, steps two and three are combined into a single step, usually called the inductive step. But first, uh, step one is always done separately. It's called the base case. You have to prove that the property is true when n equals zero. Okay, so we're going to prove a property involving the set of natural numbers. Our sequence, for example, is built from natural numbers. So we must show that whatever property it is that we want to prove is true when we plug in n equals zero into the property. It's usually a simple step and you can see right away, oh yeah, it's true. Step two is called the inductive hypothesis. We will assume that the property is true when n equals k for some natural number k. The step involves very little effort. All you have to do is write down the property that we want to prove, but we replace n with the letter k. Now, why is this going somewhere? Well, we proved step one when n equals zero. So therefore, there's at least one k for which step two works, and that is when k and n are both zero. So finally, we have the inductive step. We must prove that the property is true when n equals k plus one, the next natural number. Of course, this is where the hard work goes in, okay? And somewhere along the way, you should uh, use the inductive hypothesis that you wrote down in step two, okay? So uh, why does this work? Well, again, step one, we show that it's true when n is zero, k is zero. And then in step two, we said, okay, it's true when n equals k, right? So indeed it is true when n equals zero. Now step three, we're gonna show that if it's true when n equals k, it's still true when n equals k plus one, the next natural number. So because of that, if we are successful in proving step three, since we showed that the property is true when k equals zero, by step three, it's also true when n equals one, zero plus one. Aha, okay. Now that we know it's true when n equals one, by step three, it's also true when n equals one plus one, which is two. So now it's true when n equals two. Right, And so this goes on. Induction basically is like climbing a ladder. Right, You have a very tall ladder reaching up to the heavens, and then you have to show, okay, I can get to any step I want. Okay, how do you show that? Well, first, I need to be able to get to the first rung of the ladder. If the ladder is way too high, the proof fails. Okay, so I need to be able to step foot on the first step of the ladder. Now I have to show, if my foot is on step k, I can lift my other foot to step k plus one. Okay, can I do that? Sure. Or at least that's what we want to show. Now that I'm on step k plus one, I can climb one more step to k plus two. All right, so I can keep climbing this ladder until I can get to any step that I want. Okay. So let's go back to our example, and we are going to prove that that sequence really does converge, and as a bonus, we are going to find the limit. The monotone convergence theorem does not say what that limit is. 
If you read section 1e though, it will tell you what that limit is supposed to be, although it's not going to help us in this case how to find the limit of our example. Anyway, let's go back to our workroom. All right, so here are the terms of our sequence so far. And yeah, here we got a slightly off center. So we saw these terms also in GeoGebra. And now we have to do two things. We have to show that the sequence is monotonic, increasing or decreasing, and also bounded. Okay, so we saw in GeoGebra that, yeah, it looks like we are approaching a limit of 6.8 something. Okay, will we actually go below 6.8? I don't know. So um, we have to do two things. We have to prove, we must prove that the sequence is both monotonic and bounded in order to apply the monotone, oops, monotone convergence theorem. Now, we are going to work with inequalities. And we know that inequalities are a little bit sensitive. If you multiply an inequality by a negative number, you're going to have to flip uh, the sense of the inequality. Okay? So, uh, to make the proof cleaner, we are first going to show the boundedness property and then use it to show the monotonicity property. Okay, so first we will prove that the sequence is bounded. We will guess an upper bound, whoops, upper, <laughs> I like the letter O, an upper bound and a lower bound. All right, so let us look at our data. Commander data, show us your data. Okay, our first term is 8, and then we get 6.8, 6.8 something. So it looks like the terms are at most 8. Well, it looks like it's going down, okay? Uh, but maybe bigger than 6. Yeah, this is slowing down really. Um, yeah, I don't think it's going to go much further below 6.8. So um, we will show that uh, 6 is less than or equal to a sub n. I need my a sub n over here. And less than or equal to 8, period. Okay, so those are my lower bounds and my upper bound. We have to show that 6 is a lower bound and 8 is an upper bound. Okay, so remember the three steps of induction. So we have step one, the base step. So is it true, is it true that the first term, a sub one, is between six and eight? Okay, so we have to get on the first step of the ladder. But yes, of course, a sub one is equal to eight. All right, so we chose eight as our upper bound because that's the first term and it looks like the, the other terms are below eight. So yeah, as I said, um, step one is usually a no brainer and follows from the data. Okay, don't, don't pick seven because uh, yeah, the first term is eight. Uh, it doesn't work for eight. It works for a, a1, uh, I'm sorry, a2, a3, and so on, but not for a1. Okay, so now inductive hypothesis. So we will assume that a sub k is between 6 and 8. Okay, so we'll just copy that and we will change a1 to a sub k. All right. And now we have the inductive step. We will prove, all caps, prove that the next term, a sub k plus 1, is also between 6 and 8. Okay? So that is where the hard part comes in. So let's scoot up and say, what was our formula again? Here we go. 
This is our formula for a sub n plus 1. So we want to show that a sub k plus 1 is between 6 and 8, right? So let's modify this formula, change the letter n to the letter k. All right, so to do this, we're going to work with inequalities because that's an inequality, though it's a compound inequality. So we need to remember the properties of inequalities, okay? Uh, whenever you multiply by a positive number, you keep the sense of the inequality. And when you multiply by a negative number, you reverse the sense of the inequality. What we're going to do is we're going to start with an with the inequality for a sub k, which we assumed it's true. So we are assuming that this inequality is true. And then we're going to build a k plus 1. Think of it as order of operations, right? So first, we're going to multiply a sub k by 3. And then we're going to take the reciprocal 1 over 3 times a sub k. Then we will multiply by 4. Oh, wait a minute. There's a minus there. So let's multiply by negative 4 instead. Last step, we add 7. Okay, so those, uh, what, four steps, I believe, will allow us to compute a sub k plus 1. One more time. Starting with a k, multiply by 3. Take the reciprocal, multiply the reciprocal by negative 4, and then add 7. That's the plan. So let's execute the plan. Okay, let's center it. So we are assuming that a sub k is between 6 and 8. Okay, so what happens if you multiply everything by 3? So we will get 3ak, 3 times 6 is 18, and 3 times 8 is 24. Okay, excellent. And now uh, we're going to take the reciprocal, right? So a few videos ago, we did error analysis for uh, trapezoid method and Simpson's rule. And we encountered something like this situation where we take the reciprocal of something, right? So I hope you remember the reciprocal of a bigger number is a smaller number, okay? So when we take the reciprocal of all the parts of this inequality, and it's safe to do so because everything is positive, okay? So this is what part of what makes this work. If you had negative six there, all bets are off because you might be dividing by zero, all right? So when your number is between 18 and 24, you know that that number is positive, so we can take its reciprocal with impunity, okay? But now, that reciprocal is between the reciprocal of 18 and the reciprocal of 24, but, the reciprocal of 24 is now the smaller number. So let's put it on the left side. And where's my fraction? I'm going to uh, steal this. We're going to get 1 over 24 on the left and 1 over 18 on the right. OK, so this is a crucial step. You, you make sure you see this. 18 is now on the right as 1 over 18. 24 is now on the left as 1 over 24. It better be because 1 over 24 is smaller than 1 over 18. Okay, otherwise, that doesn't work. Okay, so now our next step was multiply everything by negative 4. Negative 4. Okay, so when that happens, you flip the sense of the inequality. Okay, so I'm going to do it this way. Uh, I'm going to copy all of this, but we're going to multiply all the numerators by negative 4. So I have negative 4 there, and negative 4 there, and negative 4 there, but this inequality is going to flip in its sense. So I'm going to copy greater than or equal to. I'm going to remove this. And I'm going to copy this, and there we go. 
I have flipped the senses of those inequalities. And now, in other words, I'm going to put it in the natural order. Negative 4 over 18 is on the left, less than or equal to negative 4 over 3a sub k, and less than or equal to negative 4 over 24. Okay, so I changed the order because everything was less than, less than, less than, and so on. This is the only one which is greater than, greater than. So let's rewrite it so it looks like the other inequalities that we have so far. And finally, we are going to add 7 to every part of that inequality. When you simply add a number, uh, you don't change the sense of the inequality. Something smaller than another and you just add the same number, uh, the smaller one stays smaller afterwards. So we're going to add 7. So we have 7 minus this. It just looks more natural this way. Let's move the minus down in front of the fraction. 7 minus that. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. But uh, but wait a minute. But wait, uh, what are these numbers? Okay, so let's actually compute. What is the value of this? Well, the exact number is 61 over 9, which is approximately 6.77. And our other endpoint over here is exactly 41 over 6, which is approximately 6.833. Okay, so we wanted to show that ak plus 1, which is this one in the middle, we have succeeded in building ak plus 1. So that ak plus 1 is what we see in the middle over there. It is between 6.7 something and 6.8 something. Okay, but what's our goal? I wanted to show that ak plus 1 is at least 6 and at most 8. What we have shown is that it's at least 6.7 and at most 6.8. So is it still true that ak plus 1 is at least 6? Yeah, because this is bigger than 6 and this is smaller than 8 and so and so we have succeeded. Our next term really is between 6 and 8. Ta-da! So that is the complete proof that our sequence is bounded by 6 and 8. Bounded above by 8, bounded below by 6. So now we know for sure that our terms will never go below 6. In fact, will it go below 6.8? Uh, not really clear. It's just saying it's at least 6.7. Okay, it's not going to go below 6.777. Okay, so now we also have another goal. We want to show that it is monotonic. In which direction? Well, we started at um, 8 and then we went down to 6.83. And then 6.804, 6.80406. So it looks like it's going down. All right. So our data suggests, our data suggests that our sequence is monotonic decreasing. Thus, we will show by induction that the sequence is decreasing, sequence is decreasing. Yeah, you know, I, I noticed um, when I was looking at our first video, our last video, I misspelled introduction uh, at the beginning of the video, so embarrassing. So we want to show it is decreasing. So in other words, um, an will be bigger than an plus one. That was from the last video also. 
an is at least equal to an plus 1. Okay, so 8 goes down to 6.8 something, and then 6.8 more something, so it's still, uh, it's going down. All right, so now um, we go through the three steps. Induction hypothesis, uh, the base step, the induction hypothesis, and then the inductive step. So let's copy this. Base step, is it true that A1 is at least A2? Okay, so when we plug in N equals 1, that will be uh, A sub 2. Is it true that A sub 1 is bigger than A sub 2? <clears throat> of course, because A1 is 8, <coughs> and A2 is... What was our 8 to? Uh, right here. 6.833333, approximately. Okay, so yes, of course, you have to look at your data and make sure that you're not contradicting your data. <clears throat> okay, so next, inductive hypothesis, we will change this and we will assume that a sub k is greater than a sub k plus 1, right? And we already know that this inequality is satisfied when n equals 1, when k equals 1, okay? So we know that there's at least one case where it's true. We will finally prove that this inequality is true when we replace n with n plus 1. So a sub n becomes a sub n plus 1, a sub n plus 1 becomes a sub n plus 2, n plus 1 plus another one. All right, so we will prove that a sub n plus 1 is greater than a sub n plus 2. All right, so uh, I mentioned earlier that we're going to, to start with a boundedness. We found 6 and 8. Because once you have proven boundedness, this also automatically proves that all the terms are positive. Okay? And once again, this is important because we're working with inequalities. If you multiply by a negative number, uh, yeah, you got to flip stuff and all that. Okay. So we're basically going to do the same uh, strategy. We're going to use the same strategy that we had in the previous step where we built the next term a sub k plus 1. Uh, whoops, I guess that should be a k plus 1 and that should be a k plus 2. Okay, we build, um, we built a sub k plus 1 from a sub k but this formula also works to build a sub k plus 2. If you replace uh, k plus 1, I'm um, sorry, if you replace k with k plus 1, you'll get k plus 2 on the left and k plus 1 on the right. So we have 2 for the price of 1. This will be k plus 2 and this will be k plus 1. All right, because it works in every term. Okay, so we're going to do the same thing, but now starting with a different inequality. Okay, we assumed that ak plus 1, uh, ak is at least ak plus 1. So what are the steps again? Multiply by 3. So same inequality, but now 3k, 3ak is at least 3ak plus 1. Multiply by a positive number, you don't change the sense. Everything is positive, both sides are positive, and so if we flip, if we take the reciprocal, the one, uh, so now the sense gets reversed. Let's do it in a slightly different way, okay? 
instead of flipping 1 over uh, 3ak on the left, we will flip 3ak plus 1 and then put it on the left. See what I'm doing here? And on the right, we will have 1 over 3 a sub k. So let me copy this one. And it's easier to just change the numerator there. Okay, so it's basically zug zug, okay? 3ak plus 1 goes on the left, 3ak goes on the right. And again, this works because everything is positive, okay? We can multiply both sides by the reciprocal of 3ak plus 1 and the reciprocal of 3ak. All right, however, we are now going to multiply both sides by negative 4, okay? So again, let's do it in a slightly different way from the one we did earlier. When you multiply by negative 4, uh, you have to flip the inequality. So this 3ak, 3a, 1 over 3ak goes to the left, minus 4 over 3ak is going to be on the left, and minus 4, 3ak plus 1, is going to be on the right. Okay, so yeah, we basically did a double flip, right? ak plus 1 went from right to left, and then from left to right. I hope you see that. So it's back on the right side where it started. Let me put the minus sign in front because... The last step is we're going to add 7 to both sides of this inequality. And we are going to keep the sense of the inequality because we're simply adding a constant to both sides. So 7 minus 4 over 3ak is greater than or equal to 7 minus 4 over 3ak plus 1. And of course, we said that on the left, we have the formula for ak plus 1. And on the right, we have, that's at least, that's the formula for ak plus 2. Hey, k, all right, ak plus 1 is at least ak plus 2, which is what we want to prove. The next term is smaller or equal to the previous term. All right, awesome. We have succeeded in showing that our sequence is both bounded and monotonic. And so by the monotonic convergence theorem, our sequence convergence, converges, okay? But what is its limit? Okay, so we saw the numbers. It looks like it is converging. Now we know it definitely is converging. And the limit should be somewhere around 6.8. Okay, so how are we going to find that limit? Okay, so this is where it all started. This is the definition of our sequence. Okay, we know that, that the sequence has a limit. We just don't know what that limit is. Okay, so let's think about it. When n is really big, like a million, a bazillion, a quadrillion, this number is very close to, uh, this number, a sub n, is very close to l. All right, but wait a minute, this is just the next number in that sequence. So th if this is close to l, this is also close to l. Okay, so here you need to take a little leap of faith with me. As n goes to infinity, the left side of this equation will be exactly L, and the right side will be exactly 7 minus 4 over 3 times L. Okay? As n goes to infinity, this equation transforms into the left side is exactly L, the right side is 7 minus 4 over 3 times L. Okay? Those two should be exactly equal to each other. Okay. So, 
we have an equation involving L, right? We want to solve that equation for L. Well, uh, what can we do? We don't like fractions, which we can rewrite <clears throat> as, okay, multiply both sides by 3L. So 3L squared equals 7 times 3L, 21L minus 4. And of course, we can write that as 3L squared minus 21L plus 4 equals 0. Okay, so there we go. We get a nice quadratic equation involving L. We know the quadratic formula. Okay, can we uh, factor that? Yeah, I don't think so. That 6.8 ugliness, yeah, we're, we can't make that happen. Okay, so by the quadratic formula, solve for L. Let's get some space here. L must be... Okay, I need a fraction. Negative B, 21. Plus or minus, ooh, I have a plus or minus here. Square root, I have a square root over here. B squared, 21 squared minus 4 times A times C. 4 times 3 times 4. Okay, and those are all positives. Okay, so what is our radical, or radicand rather? Uh, 393. Um, so we get. Twenty one plus or minus square root of three hundred and ninety three divided by oh two a I forgot the two a so that's gonna be six divided by six okay yeah unfortunately uh, square root of three hundred ninety three does that simplify any further so close to being a multiple of nine but I don't think so simplify no 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 that's about as simple as it gets. Okay, so we have two possible answers. Okay, there's a plus or minus there. And we know there can only be one limit. So we have to make a choice. Is the correct choice plus or minus? So there's some minus here, and there's plus over here. Okay, let's get approximations. This thing is approximately, ooh, 0.195, hmm. Well, we said that the sequence is between 6 and 8. That is not between 6 and 8. So that is definitely not the right answer. But is this one more believable? What are you? 6.804 looks familiar. Yep, that is now the exact limit of our sequence. Okay, so let's wrap it up. Uh, since... Our first guess with a minus is less than 6. This cannot be the limit of our sequence. Thus, our limit must be this other choice. That is the right choice. Yay! All right. So just under one hour. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. So in the coming videos, we're going to learn about infinite series. We're going to put our sequences together in an infinite sum. And we're going to ask, uh, what is your exact sum? Can we actually find that? Uh, or do you converge or maybe you diverge? All right. So until then, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.